covering all the news from every dark corner of the universe. SliceofSciFi.com Hey, greetings, everyone, to another new and exciting slice of sci-fi. I'm Michael Armenengay. And I'm Megan Zier. And I'm Sam Roberts. Awesome. Let's get to some news. Yes, please. And now the news. So NASA's Voyager 1 was recently the first human-made object to go extrasolar, right? Hopefully we all Mm -hmm. know about this because it was stupid exciting. Its trip beyond our solar system has given us a wealth of data and some spectacular images and insights into our universe. All of that has been made possible by three, count them, three (laughs) plutonium-238 batteries that power the Voyager 1. Right. Plutonium-238 is a vital component in powering the devices that explore outer space and alien worlds. But there's a problem. Mm-hmm. We're running out of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to it's come scarce. by and it's hard to find and it's like really e- rare. There are currently only 36 pounds of plutonium left in the United States stockpile, which NASA <laughs> says won't <laughs> last the space agency until the end of the decade. But hopefully they yeah. can start converting it to plutonium. There's a lot of oh, that out there. Oh, it's everywhere, the plutonium. That's right. Yeah, they should look into that. I think so. That yeah. could power starships for years <laughs> to come. Modern day alchemy. Oh, sadly, those 36 pounds won't go far, considering that it took 10 pounds of plutonium to power the NASA rover Curiosity. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that little Mars guy, he's such a diva. <laughs> um, but there is hope. He gets all the attention. There is hope. The required materials, reactors, and infrastructure are all in place to create plutonium-238. However, it will take time to stockpile enough of it to allow NASA to continue our exploration of the universe. For now, meaningful space exploration is being put on hold, and if there's a disruption to the supply chain, it could even be a greater setback. Mm -hmm. The thing that this story does not actually talk about, though, is how unbelievably expensive it is to make. Yeah. And the fact that the NASA budget has been so gutted over the Mm -hmm. last several years Mm -hmm. because of other things. Um, yeah, that's the other problem is the financial um, uh, restrictions of actually <laughs> making, making this right. stuff. Wow. So, yeah. It's, it's a problem. It is definitely a problem, especially since there's not as much of a push and there's not the work. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to get into yeah, something right, right. that I don't want to get into. So. <laughs> How about instead we, uh, we How, go to a video? Let's go to the space station. <laughs> yes. Sliceofsci-fi.com Greetings, Slicers. Tim from the Badcast here with another Slice of Space. On Friday, September 6, NASA will launch another unmanned mission to the moon. This probe is LADEE, the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. While conventional wisdom holds that the moon is an airless world, scientists have learned that this is not the case. In 1972, Apollo 17 astronauts deployed an instrument that detected helium and argon. Earth-based observations discovered sodium and potassium, which glow when energized by the solar wind. Scientists expect to find many more elements and molecules in the lunar atmosphere. This is where Laddie comes in. That is very cool stuff. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, and and, and we've actually been sending a lot of stuff to the moon lately, and <laughs> it's getting no publicity. I mean, there's the, the, the rover thing where... Um, I think it's actually an X Prize yeah. that's being built, where you they they want you to send a rover up, and you you get like a million dollars or ten million dollars or some some prize to uh, launch a uh, 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 to the surface, and it it videotapes and has to do a sample, and uh, uh, there's some parameters to it. But I mean, there's a bunch of stuff happening up there. Huh. They've done the search for water. They yeah. actually they crashed the planet. Is the it thing because we're doing planet? so much on the moon? It's no longer sexy, so it doesn't make the yeah. news. Is that happening again, like yeah. it did with it the original Apollo mission? Right? It could yeah. very well be. There's just no reporting on any of this hmm. stuff. I think I mean, there is just, here, though. There is here. That's right. right. That's why you tune in here. I think it's just because Mars is the new moon. Well, yeah. that's true. Everything yeah. exciting is happening on Mars. And I think right we should now. go on the moon and type USA rules. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need to put Chip into a chair face up there. Then we're good to go. <laughs> Feeding the moon. <laughs> How about 
got another news story. In Terminator 2, we were introduced to the T-1000, a self-healing robot from the future sent back in time to eliminate John Connor. Mm -hmm. Scientists have taken one more step towards making the technology of Skynet a reality with news that a team of scientists have created a self-healing polymer. Because there's a goal to shoot for. Because we get all our ideas from from (laughs) movies and TVs, right? Like, you know. But Terminator, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's build the technology to wipe out the human race. I'm pretty sure that's how all technology is. It's like, you could do this, but we probably won't. And then and then it happens. Yeah. yeah. But self-healing polymers, that could have some uses, yeah, right? It can have yeah, a ton right. of uses. Yeah. Scientists at the oh my gosh, this acronym is uh, <laughs> Center for Electrochemical Technologies. It's um the C I D E T E C SIDTECH. Yeah. SIDTECH. Well, plus it's in Spain, so it's a Spanish acronym, right? Right. It's in Spain. I'm gonna leave it there. Have reportedly <laughs> created a plastic polymer that will heal itself all on its own. Mm-hmm. After several early attempts prove unsuccessful, the team turned to a polyurethane base. When the polyurethane is cut, its disulfides redistribute themselves back into their original form. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, this reaction comes completely naturally at room temperature. In just two hours, the material can heal itself to about 97% of its original shape. Wow. That's uh, kind of impressive. Okay, yeah. as as a bike rider, um, I'm thinking tires and tubes. Right, uh-huh. right. That sounds really awesome. But it's not me. fast enough for tires and tubes. Two well, hours, I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. I, yeah. I still don't have to tear it apart and replace tubes. Mm-hmm. That's true. I mean, you you're know, not going to get back on the road wider, right? Right, but, oh. exactly. So, also, when stretched by hand, the material retains its strength and will not break. Interesting. This is the first time that a polymer was created that does not need any external influences for self-healing. Hmm. For now, the team is, of course, calling the new polymer Terminator. <laughs> of course they I love are. nerds. I love them. That's, That's so awesome. awesome. So smartphones can do just about everything these days, exactly. including detecting objects so small that the human eye can't see them, right? Like a tricorder. Well, oh, they yeah. got the they got the microscope uh, microscope app for your iPhone. There's an app for everything. Yes. I love it. So, including slice of sci-fi, yeah. <laughs> which you can use. There's your plug yeah. for slice sci-fi. Yeah, in landscape. Use like it in that. landscape. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> Idogan Ozcan, which is an awesome name, a professor of electrical engineering and bioengineering at UCLA, has created a smartphone attachment weighing less than half a pound in weight that can detect microscopic objects. Wow. Yeah. The as-of-yet-unnamed device attaches to the back of a smartphone over the camera lens and can view objects that are one thousandth of the width of a human hair. Oh, what? so they're adding optics to the camera. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Interesting. In testing the strength of its device, OzCan's team confirmed the images it captured with those uh, captured via a scanning electron microscope and a photon counting confocal microscope Holy in order to cow. like verify that they got. That's cool. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> OzCan believes the new technology could be used for specific and sensitive detection of subwavelength objects, including bacteria and viruses, and therefore could enable the practice of nanotechnology and biomedical testing in field settings and even in remote and resource yeah. limited environments. That sounds awesome. I'm thinking. I'm Holy thinking moly. a little more practical in that you could actually uh, you could actually scan scan water in, mm-hmm. in areas to find out whether it's got contaminants. Or, yeah. yeah. Or, I'm saying uh, these, this has some mm-hmm. serious health imp- implications. Absolutely. Right? Like, There's a for, lot of things you could use that uh, for. Science right. for the win. Science I don't know. I want to know how expensive cool. it is. Like, I don't think it's something we're just going to be able to buy at the Apple store. You don't think but so? Someday no. it could be. Maybe, but then it's I think the, that's I, a hypochondriac's the, I, worst nightmare. The <laughs> it's like, oh my God, there's so much fecal matter out of my walls. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't want everybody to have access to that, Exactly. Right? I, I think that's just really, really bad for for trouble. Yeah. The, the fecal matter attachment. It's the eye, <laughs> the eye fecal. Oh, gross. Oh, my goodness. That's disgusting and useful all at the same time. No, you never want to know how much fecal matter is around. You, really don't. you, you don't, really don't want to know. You just It's there and you can't do anything about it. I'm sorry. It is. The, the, world, the world is full of shit. That's all and, there is to it. And, uh, and, and that's what we've been talking about for the last 30 seconds is poo. <laughs> Look, and, let's, let's do some <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Covering all the news throughout time and space. This is the Multiverse News. Good evening. I'm Lance Neutron. And I am Nigel Blackwood. And these are your Multiverse News headlines. Looking to give his career a boost, M. Night Shyamalan has officially changed his name to Alan Smithy. In other news... There has been quite the heated debate on social media regarding Ben Affleck becoming the new Batman. 
first impressions are that people are not exactly too excited that he's taking over the iconic role. The most common negative opinion was that Ben Affleck was once known to play a superhero who was blind and used echolocation to find his way around, and now people will have to get used to him dressing up as a bat. In related news, actor Joseph Gordon-Levitt was last seen running down the street wearing only a cape, repeatedly screaming the phrase, I'm Batman. And here with our next story is Lance Neutron. Lance? In more comic to movie news, showing the wisdom we've come to expect from Warner Brothers, they are going forward with the Justice League movie with completely different actors. Superman will be played by True Blood's Joe Manganiello, Flash will be played by David Boreanaz, Batman will be played by Jim Caviezel, Wonder Woman will be played by True Blood and Arrow star Janina Gavankar, Green Lantern will be played by Serenity's Chiwetel Ejiofor, Hawk Girl will be played by Mia Wasikowska, and Martian Manhunter will be CGI but voiced by lost actor Adewale Akinoye Ajbahe. So congratulations to Manganiello, Boreanaz, Kavizel, Gavankar, Ejio 4, Wasikowska, and Akanoya Ejbahe. One person that isn't happy about this is actor Wiles Smythe, who wanted to play the part of Green Lantern. Uh, Lance, I believe it's pronounced Will Smith. Wiles Smith. Will. No, ha, no, no. Ha, Will. Will. Wh- Will Smith. Snit. No, uh, Smith. Smith. Fifth. Fifth. Smith. Smith. It's too hard to pronounce. Those names can be quite tricky. And that's all of our news. We now take you back to the Draco Vista Studios. Oh, uh, Nigel, this is embarrassing, but I believe it's pronounced Draco Vista Studios. Don't worry, you'll get the hang of it. News from Flight Test Land. Good evening, Flight Center. Sean Harris with your news from Flight Test Land from the Air Force Flight Test Center Museum. Ben Wallace has actually appeared on video for you guys. And so I, want, I did this because I want to show you something special. The Flight Test Center Museum just got a couple of new acquisitions. And on the interior, let's show you the first two. This is the X-4 Bantam. This was a late 40s research plane that the Air Force used to demonstrate tailless technology. still has a vertical stabilizer, but it's only a flying wing beyond that. Pretty cool little acquisition, and they painted it up beautifully. That is a gorgeous paint job they put on there. And folks, this is not a scale model. This is the actual thing. And I'm six foot. I don't think it can barely fit in that thing. <laughs> Over here, also, we have the X-48, the Boeing X-48C. This was their demonstrator for a blended wing body airliner design. They worked with it, built this with NASA, and uh, this is the later model with the big engines on it. And big is relative, obviously. But you can see how this design has changed over the years. And just think, these two really, in a way, are related. It's the same kind of technology, flying wing technology with vertical stabilizers without the horizontal stabs in the back. Very cool little thing to come into the Flight Test Center Museum. And, of course, in the background, they got this one last year, folks. That's the YF-22, the original YF-22. This one was hard for them to get. They had to go to the, when the Air Force test, when the Air Force Museum got their F-22, combat F-22, the test center museum said they want this back. It barely fit. Now it's, those are the doors right there in. Cleared the doors by less than a foot. They almost had to modify the doors to get it in. But you know what? It's worth it. Shop members out. Hey, Splice Assistant Bionic Key. Megan, as a, as a professional sociologist, you have just won my heart over, and if I lived anywhere near Arizona, I'd treat you to dinner, <laughs> just for the proper understanding and usage of the word and the very sucky idea of the patriarchy. The patriarchy! Yeah! <laughs> yes! Down with it! That's, That's what! It. <laughs> and we have... Uh, Megan is our, our resident nerd for all that fun stuff. <laughs> My re- your resident, what, feminism nerd? That's it. Yeah! I'll there be a go. feminism nerd. That you would be, be awesome. Be- uh, you need to be our feminism nerd. That's I can it. do that. Gloria Steinem. There you go. Gertrude Stein. Those are the only <laughs> two I can think of right now. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm, pro- I'm sure I could think of more, but right... Uh, w Magazine. W. No. Ms. Magazine. I'm sorry. W is the lame one. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, we got a couple minutes left. Uh, let's do a little bit of uh, listener feedback. Yeah. And, of course, you can do that by sending in the your comments to the number 206-339-TREK. That's 206-339-8735, that number thing. I haven't I haven't done that for so long. I, I know. I, do it. I feel like I haven't clicked that in a long time. I know. We just don't do that enough. Hey, Slicers. It's Steve from Central Florida. Just calling to see if you guys think that uh, Elon Musk is the reincarnation of Nikola Tesla. Uh, What's your thoughts? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, no, not. I, I'm he not seems s- to have fewer mental issues. Tesla had some problems, didn't he? Yeah, I think the it, uh, the problem with uh, Tesla was. Uh, well, no, Tesla was quite the inventor, too. I mean, Tesla was quite mm-hmm. the inventor. He invented I mean, a ton of stuff other right. people got credit for. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. Elon, no, I, oh, so maybe he learned from his last life, and Elon is figuring <laughs> out how to get credit for all his stuff he invented, unlike Tesla. Yeah, mm-hmm. Could that, be he's that, evolved. That, that was what I was going to say, is that you know, Tesla, Tesla never actually got anything in production. It, right. No. E, Elon comes from the other side. He yeah. actually gets a lot of things done. So. Right, right. Uh, Mike and I were just talking. I read a thing about he thinks he's going to have a mostly self-driving car by 2017. Right, two years before. Before three years before Google, yeah. So self-driving Google, car, that's scary, right? And Google's been running all over the country. They have them out on that's the true. roads in a few states right now. I yeah. saw one. Just yeah? uh, no, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't see it. it wasn't the self-drive <laughs> car. It was the uh, camera car. Oh, the camera oh, car. Yeah, yeah the you camera see those more. That, yeah, yeah, you see yeah. those every now and then. I saw one just uh, a next weeks time. Moon ago. it. <laughs> oh, there's, a, there's a collection on the internet of when people see the camera cars, the strange yeah. things it's caught. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's great. Yeah. There's all kinds no. of really stuff. The um, There's so many really cool ones. The, I, I remember the the first one I ever saw um, was the, the the bicycle crash guy. Mm-hmm. No, Did you I, ever don't, see I didn't that see one? that one. It was no. basically going by frame by frame, and you see the bicycle, see the bicycle, and then you don't see the kid, oh, the bicycle oh, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Google, I mean, that camera catches some odd stuff. People don't know right. what's there, and it just, yeah. I don't awesome. know. Human race, don't moon the Google camera, <laughs> yeah, please. It's been done. It no. has been done, yes. Hey guys, Rapid Eye here. Um, so, I'm flipping through the channels the other night trying to find something that's safe to watch with my wife and 13 year old daughter, and uh, we came across Jack the Giant Killer. Mm. Yeah. And I remember when that was in theaters, uh, the previews looked kind of interesting, and I said, okay, I'm game, let's watch it. And uh, I think my wife paid attention for about five minutes, ten minutes, and then she zoned out and, wasn't, and moved on, wasn't interested. Uh, but you know, I stayed and watched the whole thing, and my daughter, my daughter thought it was, you know, fairly interesting. She stayed and watched the whole thing, and I actually thought it was a pretty good story. I'm surprised yeah. it didn't do better in the uh, mm, theater. Yeah, it didn't do well. And then, uh, and I kind of talked to my wife about it a little bit. She says, "Well, what you got to understand is it, it's it's it was dark. It was it was yes. definitely too dark for kids. So when you're talking about mm. you know kids Chinese movies London. and Jack the Jack and the Beanstalk and stuff, this isn't a movie for them." I don't so know. I then, disagree. You know, and not only that, but if, unless you're a genre fan or you're into some goofy comic book fable thing, then mm-hmm. you're probably not going to be interested either. So I guess that's why it didn't do well. It didn't really have a big, it didn't have a target audience. Mm-hmm. It's it's interesting that you bring this up because mm-hmm. I, it, it's a conversation that I've had several times with some people lately. And that is there. there's this really weird disconnect of how violent and brutal the fairy original tales. fairy tales <laughs> were and how we've really cleaned them up. Cleaned yeah. them up and everybody expects them to be clean now. So when it starts mm-hmm. going back to its dark roots, mm-hmm. everybody freaks out and goes, right. oh my God, I can't believe you made us a Fairy tales like, were how you scared wow. kids right. into behaving properly, uh-huh. and that was by threatening them with death, dismemberment, kidnapping, burning, <laughs> heinous stuff. And we really yeah. don't do that enough anymore. Yeah, I no, gotta say, really I don't. have a great um, kids book from um, Germany that I remember when I was a child. My ah, mom, Germany. My mom had called Schufelpeta, which is about. I mean, it's got all these little stories about a kid. He grows his like um, fingernails too long, and then eventually mm-hmm. his like his his fingers get chopped off. And there's Dude. like there's a picture of like a chopped off spurting <gasps> blood, like in Dude, the, what? and then like he wouldn't comb his hair and he wouldn't grow his nails, and so these horrible things happen to him or the guy who's like so greedy and then eventually starved to death i mean and these were kids Dude. books Schoolful yeah Peta. It's absolutely I, I gotta say i read the Grimm's fairy tales when yeah. i was a kid and i was surprised how often satan showed up in them oh, yeah. <laughs> like honestly i'm like they just meet the devil does he just walk <laughs> around that's crazy yeah, yeah. oh my gosh i mean it, it, the, these kids are i mean they're just brutalized and terrorized and yeah. tortured and it's like oh my god mm-hmm. if you really read the original yeah. the original little mermaid oh my god oh, I've never read that. that's not an eye that's opener a, that's a bummer of a story Holy that is depressing crap. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's, uh, it's it's been really cleaned up folks but that's why you tune in to us 
Because we, we because we sh- we we unveil all these things for you. That's right. What we're we here show for. you the seedy underbelly of fairy tales. <laughs> exactly. The seedy underbelly of a lot of things, to be honest. Absolutely. But that's going to do it for this show. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, you will see us again very soon because we keep doing these things. There's we, no getting rid of us. We just don't know how to stop. We we're don't like, know what else to do. We're like the cockroaches of genre new shows. <laughs> 